there has always been conflict uh, that exists between man and animals in and around the villages around Badnagar Tiger Reserve. Um, on an average, there has been about uh, three to four human deaths each year, uh, and many more livestock is lost in this fight between man and animal. Both of them wanting their own space, which they want to call as their own home. More often than not, the tiger is blamed. Uh, so it's not just the human and livestock that is affected, but uh, the tiger and the other uh, wild animals in these areas are also. As you've seen, this is what the situation at times is around the tiger reserves of our country. India is a country with rich biodiversity. At the same time, we also have a rich culture and tradition. Wildlife conservation is not just about the animal. It involves a lot of decision making from the local stakeholders who actually live around the tigers in their backyard. So the story that you just saw on the video is actually a real life story which happens day in and day out around the tiger reserves of our country. And this is just a small glimpse that was presented today. Our tiger reserves in our country have the highest level of protection and so does our tigers. Why? Because tigers are considered to be an indicator species of the health of our forests and the denizens that live within the forest as well. So tiger is not the only animal which is being saved in the tiger reserve, but the other species that live inside the tiger reserve are also conserved and preserved as well as protected with wildlife conservation. Across our country, like I mentioned, our country being rich in culture and tradition, thanks to the cultural practices and traditional practices and beliefs that we have in our country, many of the elements in nature, like animals, trees, birds, all of them are revered and worshipped as part of our culture. And already there is a lot of tolerance that exists amongst us as Indians. And we are very proud of it. One of the factors that I consider as positives is the fact that People who live around tiger reserves do not hate the animal in their backyard, do not blame the animal for the losses that are caused to them. When we talk about conflict situations, there is a challenge in our country because with the brilliant protection that is provided by the forest department, as well as with the increasing population of our humans, you know, the, with the wildlife population increasing and human population increasing, and the land space is not increasing, the land space is limited. So with the increase in both these factors, there are bound to be a lot of interactions between the two. And when the interactions are positive, it's great. But when the interactions result into losses, that's when the conflict situation arises. And some of the losses that you've seen in the movie are actually practical ones. One of the instances that I would like to quote here is when we uh, started working in Bandhavgarh Tiger Reserve in Madhya Pradesh, we were told that a seven-year-old child was picked up by a tiger and it was killed. It was a very sad incident and we just didn't know how to start working in that village when we knew there was such a sad incident that had taken place. We visited the parents, we spoke to them, we did not ask them anything about the boy, we did not ask them anything about the incident, but we mentioned to them why we had come there, we mentioned to them what the program was all about that we were planning to conduct in the village, and we left. During our conversation, they offered us a cup of tea, we had tea, we played with the uh, siblings of the child who was picked up, and we came out. When we came out, there were tears in the mother's eyes, and the grandmother was also weeping inside. And we were very obviously thinking that probably they, was reminded, they were reminded of the kid who was being picked up. Later we realized his, uh, the child's father came out and spoke to us, and he mentioned, saying, they are not crying because of the child, they are crying because you are the first one who came to our house, who had a cup of tea, and who touched our kids. So the issues of human wildlife conflict are not just limited to science or technology, or with collaring animals, or with tracking animals, but it has a lot to do with human touch. So, we're going to talk about how stakeholders of the forests and animals and the wildlife 
who live around the forest are important for us to consider in the field of wildlife conservation. While we're talking about conflict situations, I would like to also quote some examples where when the tiger, again, I'm only quoting the tiger because that is an indicator species and it's one of the large carnivore species in wildlife in India. And one of the examples I'd like to quote is Satkosia Tiger Reserve. Satkosia is in Orissa and Satkosia Tiger Reserves started an initiative or they initiated one of the projects there whereby the first interstate relocation of tigers was happening in Satkosia. Now everything was in place. The tiger was identified. They were supposed to get two tigers, one from Kanha, one from Bandhavgarh, both in MP. They decided to relocate the individual tigers. The tranquilization happened smoothly, the capturing happened, the relocation happened, there's a soft release process that happens. Everything was put in place, science, technology, everything was in place. This was back in 2018. When they released the tiger, the people there were not ready to accept it in their backyards. The people there created a ruckus, created an issue, saying we are not willing to live with the tiger. The forest department continued their monitoring, continued the process, continued the um, plan of action. Unfortunately, within a span of six months, one of the two tigers was killed. It was poached. So the forest department then decided to trap the second tiger and bring it back to Madhya Pradesh. And currently, it's behind bars. It's in the cage. Now, that was a failure model when stakeholders like the local communities were not taken into account when the decision of relocating a tiger was made in a wildlife conservation project. Another brilliant example was Panna. Panna Tiger Reserve, I don't know how many of you would have heard about it, but Panna Tiger Reserve is one of the tiger reserves where the tigers went extinct around 2007-2008. And from 2009 onwards, the forest department decided to bring tigers back and reintroduce tigers into the landscape. Now, this was obviously a very, very uh, challenging task for our country and for Panna. And the field director and the management at that point in Panna decided to create a whole model with a motto of a very beautiful line which said, Jan Samarthan Se Baag Samrakshan, which meant protection of tigers with the help of locals, with the support of local people. And they actually practiced it. They created awareness through nature camps. They took villagers into the park, creating awareness of the need of why the tiger is being introduced there. They also allowed the locals to appreciate the forest. Slowly and steadily, when the tiger relocation was happening, people supported. People kept reporting about the sightings. People kept reporting about any animal kills, any domestic animal, cattle kills that were happening. And the compensation process was in place. We do have a compensation process in our country. So the people who lose their cattle livestock are compensated because the tiger has killed them. So that process was going on smoothly. And people absolutely cooperated and supported the whole initiative. So there were seven tigers that were brought into Panna. And today, in 2021, we have 75 plus tigers in Panna. And the motto and the slogan, Jan Samarthan Se Baag Samrakshan, still continues. So if you go to Panna, you will see in the forest department or any of the rest houses there, which say Jan Samarthan Se Baag Samrakshan, which is the first probably forest department which actually brought it out into public saying, this is what we are doing. Now, this is only to prove the point that stakeholders like the local community members are very, very important in conservation. I'd like to bring you back to the work that is happening through our NGO, Last Wilderness Foundation. Our foundation actually works in partnership with the communities and with the forest department. So we work very closely with the forest department to understand the issues around the landscape because every tiger reserve has a different issue. Every tiger reserve or every forest or every protected area has a different issue. Though it may just look alike because all of it is about human wildlife conflict, but the issues are different and so are the solutions. Every protected area has two components to it. One is a core area, which is actually inviolate space for the wild animals. And the other is a buffer area, 
where the villages are situated. So the buffer area actually supports the protection of core area, and the buffer has the human population, it has fields, it has small uh, businesses that some of these self-help groups would run, but it does not have large industries there. Large commercial activities are not allowed. So the core and the buffer together are part of any protected area. Now, working with the buffer area people is very, very important. Some of the challenges that the forest department comes up with are forest fires. When people enter the forest, there are forest fires which invariably are all man-made in India. We do not have natural forest fires in India. So somehow when the people enter to collect their NTFP products that we call as mahua, tendu patta, you know, all these smaller products that they uh, try to go into the forest to collect and they earn a living out of it. Now when they go to do that, it could be by accident, it could be by uh, intention that they probably light a BD and put it in the dry litter, leaf litter. That could cause fire. There are places where there are poaching sometimes happens. But at the same time, there are also instances where the animals enter the fields because there's ample food available there, there's adequate food available there. So the herbivores enter the fields. And behind the herbivores, there are carnivores which follow. Right? So a lot of times we do have carnivores entering the villages, like you just saw, it enters houses. But people are tolerant. People are very tolerant. Yeah? So, we work very, uh, with very interesting communities on ground and we work with the communities who live in the buffer area who are dependent on the forests. Why? Because a couple of reasons. One is the people who live there have to have the sense of ownership of protecting the forest. Many a times they feel that the animals which enter the villages belong to the forest department and they should not be coming out. Many a times people who live outside also believe that the fact that we are not allowed to go inside the park, because in a tiger reserve, it's quite expensive to go on a safari. It's almost six to 7,000 per safari, and obviously villagers don't afford that. And they are not allowed to walk into the forest because it's a core area, and you cannot walk into the forest because of legal formalities, and of course, the conflict situation. So because they're not allowed to enter the forest, they also feel that this forest is not ours, they belong to the department. So the ownership that they have to have is missing somewhere. The other reason is that there is a lot of dearth of livelihood opportunities for those people. Because there are no industries, no factories, no offices there, people living out in the buffer area do not have livelihood opportunities. And thus, their dependency on the forest is pretty high. One of the villages that we've been working with in Bandhavgarh Tiger Reserve. So Bandhavgarh Tiger Reserve, Kanha Tiger Reserve, Panna Tiger Reserve, these are uh, tiger reserves that we work in. The program that Forest Department and we as an NGO organize over there is creating awareness, is trying to take the kids and the villagers into the forest, letting them appreciate the forest and understanding that what's in it for me factor. So that if they have to protect and we believe that the people living there have to protect it because us people sitting here in the cities are not going to be able to protect the forest by just visiting it once a year or twice a year. So the people living there have to have the ownership and they need to also feel for the forest. So taking them into the forest, creating outreach and awareness is a major component of the programs that we run in these landscapes. This is another program that we run with the Baiga tribe. The Baiga tribe is one of the oldest tribes in our country and they live around parks and they're dependent on the forests. The forest department had come up with an issue where the Baiga women go into the forest to collect mushrooms just after monsoon, on the onset of monsoon. And when they do that, they're bound to face a wild animal, which could lead to a conflict situation. Now, that is where they needed our intervention. And when we started working with the Bega community, again, thanks to their traditional practices, we realized that they have a beautiful skill of making necklaces. And you will see a lot of Bega women wearing necklaces from their neck till their stomach. And they're different layered necklaces, which usually are not sold, which usually are not uh, marketed, but in this case, we decided to help them by creating a commercial product out of their own skill and tradition, and today you have a Baiga jewelry product that is available in the market, and they earn a living out of it. So there are about, okay. there are about 60 women around Kanha Tiger Reserve that are involved in this activity, so the next time you're in Kanha, you should meet the Baigas. 
Why we do this? There are also tourism activities where tourists can go visit the village, meet the baigas, and there's a lot of exchange of information that happens traditionally and culturally that is also taken care. The another tribe that we work with is the Pardhi tribe. Pardhi tribe is a, again a very, very interesting tribe. They're nomadic tribes and they used to be hunters. Now the story of Panna that I mentioned to you earlier where the tigers went extinct, they were attributed to the poaching activities done by the Pardis. So the Pardis live inside the forest, they move from one forest to another, and they are known to have hunted tigers many years ago. So in 2009, when the tigers were being reintroduced in Panna, the forest department also decided to negotiate with the Pardi community and help them to settle outside in a village. Because they used to live in the forest, they were helped to settle outside in a village. At the same time, the department also started two hostels for the kids and they are continuing to educate the kids. The hostels are available till 8th standard. We have helped them to actually beef it up to 12th standard and we support the education of all of these kids until they get a job. Thank you. The first two students, we're very, very proud to share this. The first two students from the Pardi community has graduated this year. In spite of COVID, one of the boys, has got a job, Vikrant has got a job, another girl, Sijaran, she is pursuing her B.Ed. And these are the first two kids who have graduated and we are hoping to create role models in this community which can be a more sustainable option in the long term. Now these are communities that are dependent on the forest and unless we work with them, we cannot believe that wildlife conservation is going to continue sustainably in our country. So this is some of the examples. Another initiative that we started with the Pardi community because they know so much about the jungles and the forest, so much of knowledge that they have. They also mimic the animals very beautifully. They can mimic the calls of birds. They can mimic the calls of animals. They used to lay traps. They used to create whistles with which they would mimic bird calls. They would attract the birds and then lay a trap where they would trap the birds. Now these skills, small, small skills, when we tried working with them, we realized that could be used for their benefit and could be used in a positive way. We've trained these uh, Pardi community members as guides. They take tourists out on a walk. Tourists can also camp with the Pardis and they talk about the stories of the forests and they share that with the tourists. So this is another initiative which has been sustainable, which has been run, running for the last three, four years now. And the community is very, very happy. Let me also tell you about the fact that why are we doing traditional skills or why are we picking up traditional skills? Because many times the tribals do not like to adopt a new skill. So if you teach them stitching, it is not a sustainable activity. Until such time that the NGO works there, it will continue. The moment the NGO steps out, they're going to stop working for you. So they're not going to, again, they're going to go back to the forest, they're going to again depend on the forest. So the activities that we're trying to pick up from within the culture and the tradition is something that is sustainable and that can run for, run for a longer term. So the walk with the Pardi and the camping with the Pardi activity is something that they're excited about because they love traveling, they love walking into the forest, they love being in the greenery, and this is something that they love doing. Handicraft products made by these tribals, made by the Pardis, the whistles, and the motives from the forest. These are beads that are carved out by the Pardis. And both of these are also available now as a product that you can purchase. This whistle used to be used to trap partridges. So you can actually blow the whistle and the partridge gets attracted. And they used to trap them. Of course, you need some practice to blow them. It's not easy. So it's easy uh, for us to now sell it as a product. So that's a par Pardi whistle or a Titar whistle. And this is a Pardi bead that is uh, created. Handicraft products are easy to make but difficult to sell. So it'll be really, really nice if I would love to collaborate with more people here who can help us to build on these products as well. Finally, these examples I've been quoting just to ensure and make you understand the fact that wildlife conservation is not just about the animal and it's not just about science and technology people being involved as stakeholders. And the moment we continue and accept this as a fact, saying we have to involve people as stakeholders in wildlife conservation, that is when conservation will be successful and sustainable in our country. Thank you.